we've got Deion Dawkins, freshly paid, by the way. But right now, let's bring in my favorite left tackle of the Up and Adam show, the one of note, the definitive left tackle protecting our blind side and my shiny forehead after a chemical peel. Nine-year NFL vet, one half of the Boston with the Boys podcast, Taylor Lewan. How are you? What an intro, Kay. And yes, you are glistening today, and I'll say it's working, dude. It's working. Your skin looks phenomenal. It's Thank another you. great day, another great Tuesday. Thank you. It's going to crack in it if I smile, so don't make me laugh. Uh, listen, speaking of busy weekend for you down in Miami for USC yeah. 299. Listen, those, those events always bring out the biggest stars. Uh, you were able to spend some time with, you, you know, kind of a, a polarizing figure, a, a man who mm. I believe will be the focus of the entire United States come fall, well known for, you know, his choice and how he wears his hair. Um, yeah. So how was it hanging out with Joe Burrow? Joe Burrow, listen, I thought you were going to talk about Jimmy, Mr. Beast, but yeah, Joe Burrow, we met him be, before we even walked in the arena and uh, I've, it's the first time I met the guy. <gasps> I've first never off, met him. Objectively extremely handsome human being my god his hair it seems like he just wakes up and that's how it looks but I, it's just it's impressive very very calm very present individual very clear about we talked about his hand a little bit we talked about his mindset and stuff like that so we'd love to get him on the show eventually he was with a, a bunch of other guys nick bosa sam hubbard who's uh jj watts little brother at least he tries to be and then a bunch of other guys so uh it was great talking to those guys man it was awesome what's his vibe like actually because everyone pretends that they know but i don't think anybody actually knows like what is joe burrow all about Right. If we're just talking first impressions, like, cool. Like, I'm thinking, like, Sean from Boy Meets World Cool. Like, kind of just, oh, like, Sean Hunter. chill, relaxed, like, you know, kind of just whatever people's opinion is about him. He just, nothing's going to phase him at all. It's interesting because um, somebody texted me, and this person only texts me when I'm with objectively handsome people to tell me, hey, you're with somebody that's really hot right now. <laughs> and she was telling me, uh, she was like, you know, my friend, she doesn't think Joe's very hot. Like he's got this like frat boy vibe. And I'm thinking he, Joe has like the opposite of a frat boy vibe. Like you hear about him playing chess against himself in the locker room. He seems like a guy that reads like very large books and uh, like just reads one page right. and just keeps it, keeps it moving. Extremely smart. And uh, it's just so mature for how young he is. So mature, way mature than me. Yeah. Sean Hunter from the wrong side of the tracks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it's like not not necessarily like the bad growing up because it seems like he's got a good family, but just kind of like that cool vibe, like the leg posted up in the locker kind of vibe. That's what he's got. I'm so jealous you met him. I have yet to meet him. I'm too scared. I was too scared to walk up and introduce myself to him at Super Bowl because I he's I, yeah. I, what's that about? They just you know you don't, they say not to meet your idols. I just thought like there's no way that I'm <laughs> gonna come off cool and I'm just gonna come off lame, so I don't want to do it. But he's not the only big name that you cross paths with. You met up with somebody who I'm not aware of. Unfortunately, but I can't wait to learn more about him. The Liver King, oh, Corey Neal. Yeah. What did you eat with this man? Yeah. And so uh, Liver King is a polarizing individual, and uh, he was at the thing, and then they, he, he has a chef with him that brings around bull testicles with him, and all these other players, like people, players, fighters, try it. And so it was the opportunity was brought up to me, and I have this thing. I'll try anything twice. Uh, first taste, not terrible. Not terrible. What does I think it taste of it like, like a like a yellowtail sushimi without the flavor. It's bowl, like the same texture. Balls could be on the menu at Nobu. I guess so. I guess I don't. I don't know. But to be honest, I, it was fine when I ate it. But the next hour of my life was kind of like my stomach was a little upset. I was a little uncomfortable. I started to turn pink just like him. Like it was a it was a bit of a deal. I got a little nervous because I didn't want to have that skin tone for the rest of my life. But it was it was solid. Would it was you, a solid time. Would you win Fear Factor? That's what this reminds me of. Uh, I don't think I'd have a problem with the with the like the jumping from like a semi truck to a semi truck thing. It'd be the eating. It'd be the eating live animals. So I know I would not right. win Fear Factor. They they need to bring that back in a big way though. I think that they I think that they might have tried to. I'm sure Mario Lopez yeah. is hosting it or something. I don't know. I think that, yeah, wasn't you, it? I think you it was get... Rogan for a minute. Wasn't it Rogan back in the day? Yeah, that was the Ro that's Rogan's origin story what, right there uh, as far as the film goes. Or like Howie Mandel or somebody's probably doing the the reshoot of that. Um, what would be the thing on Fear Factor that you like? you would lose like absolutely Snakes. like yeah same anything anything that revolves same. like serpents same. just disgusting creatures my daughter literally want, wants a snake and i told her like that i she i try to give her hope for everything no, there's zero hope when it came a, to that I, I don't trust people who have snakes or want snakes like, we gotta get her out of the, it's just a face 
It's just a phase, yeah, baby girl. My wife had one. My wife had one growing up, and I literally almost divorced her on the spot. That's how much I hate snakes. Oh, my goodness. Okay, let's get into some other things here. The king of NFL contracts, not the king Cobra. Let's talk about this. Kirk Cousins. This dude... I mean, him and Matthew Stafford, they just need to do a master class on how to get paid. Unbelievable. He goes, mm. I had Matt Ryan on yesterday, and he said, yeah, it'd be a good deal. They should get aggressive and do it. I was hesitant. I'm like, are they actually going to get it done? Um, but, of course, they come to terms. Kirk Cousins is now a Falcon. Great, great weapons. Great opportunity for him. Nice division for him to be in. Why Do you, do you think it's a good fit, and why? Yeah, I do. I think there's a, a, for a couple of reasons. One, Kirk is one of the underrated cats in the league. I know that the playoffs haven't really been his his vibe and stuff like that, but very, very productive in the regular season. He's got B. John Robinson, who the dude can really do anything. Uh, I think Pitts is going to have a, a big, he's going to really do one of these this year. The thing, my first reaction when it happened was, man, I wish, I wish Arthur Smith was still there to kind of reap the benefits of having a quarterback like that, because I think he would absolutely thrive in that type of situation. But, I, you know, I'm happy for Baker Mayfield in Tampa, but I think the Atlanta Falcons are the team to beat in the NFC South. That, that's that's a big deal. Also, Kirk Cousins, I think his wife's family is from Atlanta. He spends a lot of time there, so that writing was kind of on the wall a little bit. He's a big family guy, and to see him go down there, I think it works out perfectly. I like it for him. Him, him versus Baker, I think, will actually be very, very fun. Baker's a, a paid man, something to prove. He's got Mike Evans, and then hopefully this Falcon squad can, can you know, sort of turn things around and make some waves. Um, the other big news as far as waves in the quarterback world, Russell Wilson ends up in Pittsburgh. I know it's kind of old news mm -hmm. now. There's like fun, bigger stuff going on. But let's, let's dig into this because you've spent multiple years in Tennessee with Arthur Smith. It's your boy, the mustachioed cal caterpillar one. Um, how does this work? I mean, I think it's a, it's a low risk for the Steelers. You get, you get Russell Wilson for like what? $1.9 million. And then the Denver Broncos are have the biggest, heaviest cap hit of all time. This is a, I think this is a perfect storm for Russell Wilson. I'm not the biggest fan of Russell Wilson. However, I think at some point, this is me making a lot of assumptions when he was in Seattle, having the success he did at a young age, he, it just became like he was bigger than every, than, you know, the game itself, like, you know, celebrity wife, he's doing all the things he's got the danger, witch and all that stuff. And I think he got, he got humbled quite a bit at the Broncos. And I know there was a couple of guys in the team that I spoke with towards the end of that first year, he actually brought some of the guys together and he apologized for the way he was acting and kind of not necessarily being a, a part of the team, but thinking he was the team. So fast forward and now going with the Steelers, Having a guy like Arthur Smith in an OC position, I think, is a, is a big win because it's not going to be, hey, we're going to rely on you all day, every day. You're going to hold the ball. There's going to be great reads for him. Arthur's going to set up amazing game plans, but he's going to make Najee Harris like he's really going to put him in a, uh, a good position to do the run game very well. So they're going to run the ball quite a bit. They're going to live off the play action. It's going to be not as much pressure on Russ. And Mike Tomlin has a history of having unique personalities around him and having them thrive. So I think this is going to be a big win for the Steelers. You met Joe Burrow. I finally got to meet Will Levis. I met him with you on Zoom. I remember I was like right. in New York, fever dream. And you were on my set at Super Bowl. We have talked to Will. And then I got to meet him later that week. And I, I like him a lot. And I really mm -hmm. want to see him supported in Tennessee. And your team made some moves, right? They sign Lloyd Cushenberry. They have the nice center. They, they, they bring in Tony Pollard. Where are you in the grieving process with a truly irreplaceable Derrick Henry but are you are you co-signing these moves as the right moves? Yeah, the first thing is is Derek. I mean, I think Tennessee fans just need to be happy and just you smile because it happened. Don't cry because it's over. Type of type of mentality. Yeah. Derek is is for, forever my top five teammates of all time. I love <laughs> that guy so much. And wherever wherever he goes, I tweeted this yesterday. Wherever he goes, I'm a fan of that team this season. That along with the Tennessee Titans as well. But um, as far as Pollard goes, my first reaction when they signed Pollard was like, well, they got Tajay Spears and they're very similar backs. They can get open. They run routes. They're very good uh, from a passing standpoint. So at first I was a little confused, but then I started thinking about more and more about Callahan and the offense he's going to run. He's going to have – he's going to spread them out. He's going to be throwing it all over the field. Will Levis is going to – you know, it's going to be a boomer bust situation for him, which I think he'll thrive, especially if they keep adding pieces in the offense line and give him time. And having two backs that can carry a workload – throughout four quarters and not be tired is going to be massive. And so it's a, it's very, it was interesting, interesting to me at first, but now thinking about it more and more, I think this is a big win for the Tennessee Titans offense. Um, what if Derrick Henry, who you love top five teammate, what if he out the door was like, Chris Johnson, you're dead to me. I hate you. Cause that's what happened with Saquon. And with Tiki. Tiki. Yeah. Did you see this yesterday? 
Yeah, I saw it and I thought it was ridiculous, but I'm also uh, easily a victim to clickbait. I'm always a guy that just reads a caption and then never dives into whatever article. Okay, I so think let, this is. So, let's, so let me set it up for you here. We've got, Go uh, this is kind of how it happened. Um, Saquon Barkley chooses to sign with the division rival, which is fun anyway, good fodder, whatever. And he was compelled to respond to Tiki Barber, um, who I guess, actually, yeah, he has no love for Saquon. And Tiki said, you're dead to us, Saquon. Good luck, you're dead to me. Saquon says, you're the prime example of loyalty to a team. I got the deal I wanted. I secured, I can't even read this. I don't, I, it's too small for me to freaking read. Yeah, it's impressive that yeah, you could even try to read that. Actually, not not a great look for us. Sorry. Yeah, um, but, but we got we got the gist of it. They, they, you know, Saquon. I love this for Saquon because I just think it's hilarious, and he's like one of the last people that I would think would burn that sort of bridge. But it, it seems like he had enough or something. I, no, I what I heard was mm -hmm. that the Giants really didn't even offer a contract. And you go back to last year where they're working through franchise tags and the running back market. They're thinking about allegedly thinking about having their own union and everything. So there, there had to be some some bad blood. There it is. Uh, I got to New York and all that did to me. Yeah. Listen, I think Saquon, I, I always kind of enjoy when a player, a, a highly <laughs> touted player goes from one div like into another divisional team. It's a nice little F you as you're walking out the door and they're going to have to see him twice a year on a team that's not going to have Jason Kelsey, but still have, have an elite offensive line. And whenever you played the Giants, there was always, hey, you got to take care of 26. And so they've lost their entire offense. Yeah. That's that's really, that's what Saquon was. So, I, you know, Tiki Barber, I, I don't agree with it. I think it's a ridiculous statement to say you're dead to us and this and that. Like, just be happy that the guy crushed it for you, handled the diversity of tearing an ACL and Crazy. coming back and, you know, working through it and having a great career, a great year last year. So, I think it's a it's kind of a ridiculous remark by by Tiki, and that happens all the time. There's two or three guys that went to other AFC South teams from the Titans, and it sucks. You hate to see it, but at the same time, it's like if you're if they're not going to pay you, go get the money you need to get paid. And that's just how that's how this game works. You can't. There's such a, a hilarious thing when people talk about loyalty, 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 but it's like the NFL jokingly stands for not for long. Like these teams are going to use you until they, they until they don't your past your prime and then they're going to move on. And if Saquon's going to get a better deal or a deal that he's proud of in a division in the same division then I have zero issue with that. I think it's a big win for Saquon. I mean Saquon's not responding that way to one comment mm. made by Tiki Barber on the way out the door. That has to mm. be a conflict. There's no way Saquon's doing that. It's got to be a conflation of like you're, you see me and you smile, and then you go on your radio show and you criticize me, or you don't. He right. clearly feels like you didn't have his back. Kind of a cautionary tale for you, Taylor, as you're, you know, you're straddling the fence a little bit, getting your, you've got your year of being outside the league for a year. I mean, it's a tough gig because Tiki, on his side, if you're defending him, like he's got to be as objective where he's allowed to have his opinion and stuff, even if it rubs, you know, a Saquon through the years the wrong way. But that's, yeah, like, that's, I, I think. Yeah, that's the gig. Yeah, I think it's, but it's not, that's not an objective thing about that Tiki said. That's yeah, like yeah, his that emotions getting the sure. best of him. For yeah, sure. it's, it's, it's wild. To me, and working through this, like you and I have on this show, and speaking with Stephen A. Smith also, who has a relationship with athletes, but still speaks as bluntly as possible. Yes. He, uh, I, we spoke to him and he's like, you know, I'm, I've made it clear with players. Like I will be your friend. I'll always have your back. But objectively, if you stink, I have to say you stink. And that's, and that's how it needs to work. But Tiki saying like, oh, you're dead to me. You're dead to this franchise. It's like, oh, that's just, why are you getting so emotional? Like what's going, yeah. what's going on? Like, it's just, it's, that's wild to me. You should be more mad at the franchise for not giving him more money. If that's, if, if you're, if you're going to be mad about the situation. Um, I just think if I was a, if I was the publicist for Saquon Barkley, I couldn't have written it better. Like mm -hmm. respond this way and instantly endear yourself to a fan base that, that is so Philly it hurts for you to do that out the door to a, a, you know, a, a, a New York Giants sort of great, as it were. I think it's amazing, amazing theater, and I can't wait to see them face off twice a year. Now, you were at the Combine, my friend. You were in mm -hmm. Indy. I was in Mexico drinking mojitos, so I need a little, nice. I know it was a couple weeks ago, but um, I'm gonna give you a little rapid fire here. After what you saw, give me the best offensive lineman heading into the draft. Man, I really enjoy – God, I, I kind of forget get his name, but he's uh, the Samoan cat from Oregon State. I thought – I think it was uh, – Maybe Hamilton texted to me. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have, have him texted to you. Right They're those – Fulaga. 
that I thought his his lateral movement, he was very crisp. He didn't seem like the moment was too big for him when he was working through his combine exercises. All that stuff when you're in your underwear running around is really just checking boxes. But to see him kind of like elevate himself above the rest of the groups and stop on a dime, move back over, very fluid in his hips. I was impressed by the way he was moving. I think when we all sitting there kind of watching and observing, he was one that you're like, wow, this guy really is, you know, ready for the next step. Notre Dame tackle Joe Alt. Titans could take him. They, Round one, yeah. should they? Yeah, I think they should. I think um, I think he's a left tackle. I don't think he's a he's a switch back and forth. That's one of the common misconceptions I think people have of being like, oh, offensive lineman, we can put him wherever we want. I think Joe Alt is a uh, tried and true. He's going to be a left tackle in the league. I don't know how comfortable seeing him in his stance flip back and forth from left tackle to right tackle in those drills. He reminded me of, of me a little bit where – very uncomfortable in a right-handed stance, very comfortable in a left-handed stance. So I think he would do best maybe falling to, I believe, the seven mark, which is where the Titans are, as opposed to going a five where the Chargers are at, talking about moving him to right tackle because they always have, already have a great left tackle. I think Joe, he's he's the dude's uh, like a, a half an inch taller than me. He's built like a he's like, like a brick S house. And so he's <laughs> he's an impressive human being. He, he checked all the boxes, wasn't like incredibly athletic as far as like 40 time or bench press, but yeah. did all the things he had to do. And he was, he was good enough in all of them. And so I don't think he hurt himself at, at all at that combine. I think he's going to be a great pro. I mean, it's his 10 year, 10 year anniversary of your combine. So mm -hmm. I kind of like that Alt's crushing it. You're like a combine wizard, giving me all the goods from Indy. Um, Michigan quarterback, JJ McCarthy. He looked good. Where do you rank him among yeah. the quarterbacks in the draft right now? Uh, man, that's, that's difficult because I don't, necessarily follow all of the quarterbacks um i've had a couple of comments i've made about caleb williams that like oh, you know just my very critical yeah critical in the sense of just that's the opinion that i had when i saw you know how he went to the combine how he kind of handled himself in the press conference seemed very full of himself in a lot of ways not taking away from his talent and who he is as a you know as a, as a player but it just seemed to me very I, 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 or me, me, me in those type of situation. JJ, on the other hand, you look at his press conferences and how he handled himself. He was very much, hey, I'm, I was focused on the W category, and we did really well on that. I was focused on having helping my team win. Now, a lot of knocks on him were, hey, he didn't throw the ball as much as other guys. But, you know, I, I think when it comes down to it, of being battle-tested, he's going to walk in. I think he's going to maybe start the fastest of any other quarterback in this draft.